polar coordinate curve. one problem in which you have to expand uh, this, this uh, function that is one of the square root of Thank you. 
kind of obvious. The right first boundary position is to see them, right? When you apply this, then you use your probability conditions. And these are these functions that I have here that we know some of the properties are from here. If I apply the boundary condition, then I have to say when I multiply both sides of this by its own PL, right? Uh, then I'm going to get the, on the right hand side, I'm going to get 2 over 2L plus 1. On the, on, the left, on the right hand side, on the left hand side, on the right hand side, I'm just going to get this, which I have to integrate over. And I might be able to do this in, in sort of closed form. I might not be able to do that, but at least I can write it down. Okay? So these are the orthogonality conditions that we have. And we get this problem. Let me see if this is Yes. So we did this problem uh, in which basically if we look at the continuity of the potential flow, sometimes we will have to find the potential only in some region in, in the space, and another time we will have to find it everywhere in the space. If I do this, then because now if, if I, the origin is included in my expansion, then I have to make my function regular at the origin so it cannot go up. So this in here, which is for r less than r, cannot include uh, terms of the order one over r because it blows up for the origin. So I have to re break out my solution with this. But the potential, in addition to the boundary conditions that I wrote, I have to also use the fact that the potential is always continuous across the interface. Okay? So when you write v out and v in across any, anything, the other condition is, is that v is continuous across the interface. Okay? Yeah. Is that always true? Is there any exception to that? No, there's always true. Okay, so now what about the electric field? So the electric field is not necessarily continuous. It is continuous if you have, say, a charge distribution and there is no surface charge density on the surface of this charge distribution, right? And so then you will have the, the electric field can be continuous. But then there is another kind of boundary condition that we will have, which is the one that is not really the value of the potential of a particular boundary, but is derivative. And those kind of boundary conditions are called Neumann boundary conditions, right? So then in this case, say you have a charge distribution that you didn't know what it was, but it was some sigma of theta on this surface A. Then what is sigma? Well, sigma, right, is equal then in this case to epsilon zero E out minus epsilon zero E in dotted into the norm. Now why do I have the minus sign in here? If you guys recall, because the outward normal, remember, is uh, you take it always to be in the direction of increasing whatever the radius is. Or if it's x, it's in x hat direction, right? If it's r, it's in the r hat direction, right? That's the outward normal. So when I looked at the electric field inside, generated by any kind of charge distribution, the electric field basically has to be pointing in the opposite direction unless I have some charge inside that you know takes me downward, right? So we went through this in, in the the section of conductance. So then <coughs> we will see later on that this is not necessarily the case, the epsilon zero case. Because when we look at dielectrics, I can have a material that has a different epsilon inside than outside. Okay? And in that case, even if I do not have a surface charge density on this, in other words, this could be zero, the electric field is not continuous because the epsilons are different. I have vacuum outside and I have some material that has a different permittivity. And so if you have, if, if this is outside, this will be epsilon zero. If this is inside some material, this could be a different epsilon case. And there's just no way that these two things would be equal, right? Even if I don't have any charge density. So then from here, I can then write that this is equal then to epsilon zero for this problem, right? And then I have to write what this is. So this is going to be out the R evaluated at r equals to a, minus and minus will give me plus, now here, the v in the r evaluated at r equals to a, right? This is what I will have to have, and so when I take these derivatives, I have to take the derivative now of these functions with respect to r. Notice that the pl doesn't do anything. I can take also say, oh, but the electric field is tangential component is continuous across the interface, right? So I can say, oh, but also if I take the derivative, which is a tangential component, which is one over r dv d theta, right? That's what it is. Across the interface, 
well, it doesn't do me any good because I'm taking the derivatives of this guy and that guy and they're exactly the same. So basically I boil down to this equal to that, which is the continuity of the potential, right? So that doesn't give me anything. But so then this is what I use for those problems that you have in the homework where they tell you, oh, I have some surface charge density, which is proportional to cosine squared or sine squared theta, right? And so now you have to apply your solutions to find what the coefficients are. And this is the exact condition, right? And so between these two things, notice that I have the same AL here. I have the same AL here. I, and ideally, we should have a B sub L here and an S sub L here. But because the potential is continuous across the interface, then at R equals to A, or in this case R capital R, I will have to have this is one, this is one, and so this, this has to be two, that one, right? right? Now, I wrote it in this form that is different than the form that we had at initially, right? Initially, what we had was the potential V of R and theta was equal to the sum L equals zero infinity <coughs> of A L R to the L plus V L R to the minus L plus one times by T S. So here we identify that there is already a <coughs> surface that describes this parameter R that when I'm over there, I basically have to do this expansion in terms of those things. So in some sense, what I'm doing here, you look at it, and this is the reason I introduced this at the beginning, this is, all of these terms will always be less than one for V in. Because capital R is always less than R when I'm inside, right? Here, on the other hand, is the opposite. This, all of these terms will get smaller as I'm getting further and further away from the, my sphere because capital R is always less than R for when I'm outside. So in some sense, these coefficients are converging. They're getting a smaller and smaller. If I get you know, closer to R equal to zero, right? As far as I'm gonna add, R is equal to zero, this is zero here. And this goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. So this will give me infinity. So I'm doing an expansion in some sense of one over R. So when I look at this here, <coughs> Then this S here can be either, either, S can be either R over R if R is greater than R, or S can be equal to R over R if R is less than R. You see? And so then I can rewrite my solutions in terms of this type of expansion. So let me go to, to this case. So th this is a case that we did for the, for the coefficients. And so now let's talk about this generating function. And so this has to do with this problem 512. And so if I look at what the generating function is, then for right now, imagine that since I have said to you that I can expand any function in terms of the general polynomial, right? And we have said that. Then I'm going to only parameterize this in terms of some parameter s. u is my cosine theta. So any function of, of theta I can expand in terms of the general polynomial. That's clearly true, right? Because this is an expansion from L equals zero to infinity. But now all I have to do is basically parameterize this function in a power series in S. So I multiply by S to the L. And now if I do that, then I can imagine that I'm going to use this definition to generate all general polynomials, which again we do not use that, right? It's too complicated to use them. What we do is this recursion relationship that I talked to you about. <coughs> so if I take the nth derivative of g with respect to s, I'm not taking the derivative with respect to u, it's with respect to this s, and this doesn't depend on s, right? All I'm doing is pulling terms out here and evaluate this as s equal to zero, then this should be equal to n factorial p n of u. And this is a trick we use all the time to, to, to simplify a solution. So let's, let's look at that at that expansion in some more detail. So if I, if I write g of u and s, as I wrote over there, right, then I'm going to have that this is equal to p0 plus s p1 plus s squared p2 plus s u p3, right? That's what this thing is here. L is equal to 0, I get p0, L equal to 1, I get p1, and so on. You see what I mean? 
So now let's say the derivative of g will affect less. What is this equal to? This is now p1 plus 2sp2 plus 3sp3 the square plus so so, right? That's what it is. But say I evaluate this at s equal to 0. So if I evaluate this at s equal to 0, then this, all of these terms will be 0 and only left with p1. Right? And so let's do the second derivative. So now the second derivative for g with respect to s, right? Well, that should be equal to 2p2, right? Plus 6p3, s plus a whole the higher term. So evaluate this again at s equal to 0. What do I get? This, all these terms will be 0, and I'm going to get 2p2. And 2 now is what? 2 factorial, right? And I, so for d3, I will do the 6 now, and 6 is 3 times 2, which is 3 factorial. So then this whole, so the n derivative of g with respect to s evaluated at s equal to 0 is this. Now, why do I say that this is a trick? It's because I'm using this, but in fact, this pl could be anything. This could be some vessel function, right? It could be anything. And then I will get this solution because I'm multiplying by this s to the l and the derivative with respect to what I put in there had nothing to do with this. But the issue is this, what is the Legendre equation? The Legendre equation that on the right hand side I get pn. And what is this pn? It's basically this equation, which is the Legendre equation divided by l over l plus one, right? In other words, p sub l here, if I put an l in there, should be equal to minus this divided by L over L plus 1, right? That's what it is. So I can put that in there, and then I can then write the, the derivative of u with respect to this. Look at that, I have a dg du. Why do I have that in here? Because that's the pl du, right? You see what I mean? And so I can, and, and now of course I know what pl is, because of this derivative that I have. So when I expand this, this is basically, you know, you can go through the algebra here, but this is, and then you can rewrite this uh, by minus s d d2 of the s of s g. So this, now I converted my Legendre equation into an equation of this function g. It's all I'm saying. So I wrote it like this initially. Then I said, what equation does p side, p l satisfy, which is this one? Then I basically find what p, which is here can be written in terms of this differential equation. I write the PLDU in terms of what it is here due to the derivative. Thanks, David. And then I, I end up with this differential equation. Okay? And so now uh, the solution to this equation, or this uh, what I write it now is a partial differential equation because U, G depend on two variables, U and S. So this will be a partial with respect to u, right? And then here I have a second derivative which is a partial with respect to x. Now I need to apply boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions are that g of u equal to zero is equal to p zero u equals one, right? This is what we have to have for, for these terms. And so then when we solve for this differential equation, which I'm not going to go into, this is the solution you get for g. So this satisfies then this differential equation. And you know, for those of you that really want to get into this, this is not too hard to do. I mean, this is some high order, so mathematical methods, but it can be it's not too hard. So then this is my solution that I get, and so if I look at this solution, right, and then I look at what this is, which is a generated or the Jagger polynomial, this is the homework that you have to do. You didn't have to do all the steps that I have done just now to show you how we got to that generating function. But they told you, imagine that this thing here, which I can put down on the left hand side, is equal to this on the right hand side, right? So then what I'm telling you, imagine that I have that this that I wrote here, this is equal to the sum L equals zero to infinity of S to the L PL of G. Right? Then let's expand this term, term by term, for S small. You see what I mean? So if s is my uh, term that I have that is a small, then I can imagine that 1 over the square root of 1 plus x, right? Well, this is equal to 1 minus 1 half x 
plus b to the eighth x squared, and so on, right? This is what it is, so this expansion. So I'm gonna take this x that I have here and make it equal to s squared minus two us. And I'm gonna put this in each one of these terms, okay? Then I'm gonna collect terms of powers of s, linearness, quadratic in s, cubic in s, and then the, these are the PLs of the, 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 the coefficients that go with s squared will be p2. The coefficients that go with L s cubed will be p3, and so on. This is what you have to do with the homework problem, right? Now you can see why that is, because this g that I have here, which is this term, is basically the generating function of all these Legendre polynomials, because I can then write that the Legendre polynomials, this, the nth derivative with respect to s of this function at s equals zero is just n factorial p two. Okay. In the homework though, the coefficients were kind of weird because um, like the last term, the cubic term was fifteen out of forty eight or something like that. Yeah, that's so what it is. But you have to find the square root. So fifteen over forty eight is the cubic term. And so now you have to combine all those terms, all the cubic terms that you have, and then that will give you p. So now let's go back to my point charge and all the things that we do. So let me do the following. So this is the important part now because we did some math, and my take is is that you know if you expend some money or something, you need to see some return of the money you spent. You have done a lot of homework and a lot of effort in learning this. Now there is a payoff that has to be on the what, 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 what I do all this for? So this is an immense payoff. Because now imagine that we wrote early on, we wrote what is B of R, let's call it R, right? In terms of any function that was, uh, not function, but some charge distribution, right? For a point charge, V of R, remember, was equal to the location of the charge, Q over 4 pi epsilon 0, 1 over R minus the location of the charge, which I'm going to call R sub Q, right? That's what it was. This is my observation point. This is the location of this charge Q, right? So if I basically put my center here and I put my charge Q at A, in the z direction, right? And I'm gonna ask what is the potential at this point here, I need to know this distance. And this distance is basically r minus this distance a in the k hat direction, right? So that's what we did for q. But what happens if I have a very weird charge distribution? So I have to write one over four pi epsilon zero, the integral of rho at r prime over r minus r prime Right? That's how we wrote it. So then the issue is, I always have this one over r minus r to the prime everywhere. So now let's look at what this is. Well, if I look at that function at the bottom, then I can expand it for a region here. I can always say, well, let me consider the case in which and I'm looking at something that it is away from that charge distribution. So if I have a charge distribution, Let me, if you don't mind, let me take this off and let me put a charge distribution here that has some extent, okay? So now this has some extent and you're looking at some region here. And this is R prime, some element here, which is R prime. But whatever you're looking at here is away from whatever volume might enclose that charge distribution. So I have two possibilities. I can look at the region inside the charge distribution, in which now R should be less than R prime, or it can be outside of it, in which now R is greater than R prime, right? So if I do that, if you look at this term at the bottom, one over R minus R prime, then I can write as one over R squared minus two R, R prime times the cosine of the angle between them plus R prime <coughs> times the square to the one half. And now I can decide 
which of these R and R primes are big one with respect to the other. Say R is greater than R prime. So then I can write this as one over R times now one over the square root of one minus two R prime over R times the cosine of the angle plus R prime over R quantity squared. Now this is becoming very familiar. This is my S function that I have here, which is S to the L, P, L to the U, right? So then in that case, if I have this, then I can write it like this. And remember, this cosine is not necessarily theta. It's the cosine of the angle between R and R prime. If I pick R prime to be in the Z direction, then that is a cosine theta, okay? Otherwise, it's a cosine of the angle between R prime and R. So then I can write immediately that one over x minus x prime, I can write it as the sum PL cosine theta of L to the zero, R L over R to the L plus one, this is R prime well, R L, for R greater than less than R prime, and R to the L, R to the L plus one for R greater than R prime. So, so let's do an example. And this problem is will be very hard. You need to try to do this problem without the math that you learn now on your own, like we did before, which is what is the potential of this disk? But I don't want the potential on the z-axis, I want the potential of all axis. I want this potential now, <laughs> everywhere in a space. Right now I have this, but I give you this problem. But if I had given you to do at the beginning, then you could have, uh, have you would have been up to now working on it, I'm sure you would have been able to have gotten it, you know, because of cannot be done by integration alone, in full form anyway. So then I want the potential due to this charge distribution, which has some element dq, which is equal to lambda a dp, where a is the radius of this thing, right? And this is some element, and p is the angle that this element makes with the p-axis. And so I want the potential subplace up here at some point r, which is the x Then you might say, why do I want to do this? Why? Because I have, to, I have to have some charge here located there, and then I have there, and there is an angle that this thing makes. So in order to appreciate it, there is no words. You have to try to do it. Okay. And so now you say, no, I'm not going to do that problem. I'm going to do the problem on the z-axis, which is a trivial one. It's just trivial. I put it on the z-axis or some distance z away. This is for the electric field, but the distance is basically dq. It just now is at a distance a squared plus z squared. And notice that the distance is the same no matter where I am on this thing. It's all of them are a squared plus z squared. I don't have to do any integral because the potential now is the integral over d phi, right, of this d lambda that I have here. But the distance stays the same, so I have that then if this is Vz is now my dq over 4 by epsilon 0, 1 over a squared plus z squared. So when I integrate over d phi, I get that this is 2 pi a lambda over 4 pi epsilon 0, and so the 2 pi cancel, and I get L times lambda, the you know, charge density here, over 2 epsilon over this. Now, I can make problems more complicated by making lambda actually a funk or, or a surface, and instead of being, you know, a, a I can make it to be a disk. It doesn't make any difference. A so map of that we put in the graduate on the gradual level the disk problem. Off axis. So okay. lambda, so question is a wavelength? What? What is lambda? Lambda is the line charge density. So if you look at the amount of charge on this disk, it charges some charge Q and it distributes uniformly on this disk, on this hoof, then the area, the, I mean the, the length of the hoof is two by eight, right? Mm -hmm. So the amount of charge on it will be lambda, which is the charge per unit length, times 2 pi a. Okay. okay, thank you. So lambda is a constant. So now I said for c greater than a, on some axis here, and I look at my function here, and then I can pull the z out, and I get that this is z over 1 plus a squared over c squared. And I'm going to expand this. And 1 over c is 1 minus a half plus 3a. Oh, and I'm sorry, this is a 15 over 48 here. I didn't even notice that. So there is a 15 or a 48, a to the 6, c to the 6, right? And I can keep going. It's not too difficult to get it. This is the time to form this, uh, to, uh, an expression to get all of the terms of the So now, for me to find my point here, all I have to do 
knowing your work, this is the math that I told you you learned, I have to do anything. I simply substitute Z for R. So I put R here. And then I multiply each term in the expansion by the Lajada polynomial of the appropriate order. So you now have 1 over R cubed, because this is at the bottom. Then I, I put 1 over R here, right? So that's why I've written the 1 over R in here. So all the terms, all the terms, this is R squared, so I have to be P2. This is R to the 4, this has to be P4. R to the 6, this is P6, right? So then my potential then becomes this. A L over 2 epsilon 0, 1 over R, 1 minus a half A over R squared P2 plus 3 eighths A L to the 4 P4, minus 15 P6. And I'm done. Okay. So now for more complicated problems, obviously now, like I told you before, there are very many different ways of doing a problem. But what you ought to think about is the symmetry of the problem. So if you have a problem that has a symmetrical symmetry, if you say, oh, going to do this. instead of doing all these expansions and so on, I can easily integrate and find the potential on the z-axis. And then I can expand this potential and find my solution everywhere. And this is an extremely powerful thing for complicated problems, right? So now, I'm going to pause now, and I'm going to let you, you know, uh, enjoy this, but I'm going Thank to you. ask you what happens if R is less than A? Because I did the expansion for R greater than A, right? So what do I need to do if I'm interested in getting close to this disk? So what is R less than A for me? Well, it means that if you look at this disk, from my symmetry point of view, that this really is a cross-section of a sphere, right? In some sense, that's what it is. So on the z-axis, I, I, let me rewrite it, let me draw this in an easier way. So, so when I look at my disk, I have to have a region, right? And my disk is at the center of this region, right? And so this was the z-axis, this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, this was A, which is also is the radius of this the sphere. There is an imaginary sphere, but you can see that now that is the symmetry of the problem, right? So this 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 disk, this hoop is basically inside some region. And when I said I want R less than A for R, is like saying Z less than A, the radius of this thing. See what I mean? Now if you are on top of it, you obviously, this is A here. But if I want a spherical symmetric thing, even if I am over here, let's say I'm over here, the answer is still is this one up there, N squared plus Z squared. Z can be zero in that expansion because I have the square root of it, right? Zero. I don't have to expand anything. But if I want to have my answer now to be here, then, ooh, I'm not on Z anymore. I'm at some point inside. So I need to then do an expansion for R less than this A. And A is defined by the radius of this hoop, even though it, uh, you know, I can find the Z axis without doing any expansion what the value of the potential is for any z, less or greater than, than a. That's probably because I have the close point for any of the z axis, but not away from the z axis, so we don't have that. So what do I need to do to find my answer for r less than a? Do you have to pull out the a instead of the z? So I have to pull out the a out of the z. For the expansion? Okay, so you will expand in terms of A over Z, you will expand in terms of Z over A, right? Is that right? So in this expression, what do I need to do? I put A here. I put R here and I put A here. That's all. I don't change anything else. I just erase A, put R, put A, this is A, and this A stays the same and I'm done. It's not a lot more work. And that comes from the previous expression that we had, which is this one. That now I can have x minus x prime, and I can say, well, what is the solution? If you look at this interchanging r prime with r, it's exactly what I'm doing, right? Because if r is less than r prime, I get this expression, right? 
But now, what happens if r is greater than r prime? I get the same expression when you look at it, it's replacing r prime with r. That's all I got. Now, in some sense, what I told you earlier, and, and you might not believe me, now the math is a little bit more complicated, but the problem becomes easier to handle. A, because sometimes you have to write this thing not necessarily in closed form, we leave that at the gradual level, but you can write it in an expansion. You can just leave it like that. And you, don't, you don't have to really do a lot of math in terms of finding a closed form for these things. Questions on this? Okay, so now that we have this, let's go on to this problem, which is now asymmutal symmetry. But I have cylindrical coordinates. So now, unfortunately, I'm going to use this notation that they have in the book, which I do not like. I have to be about this. Most textbooks, this is rho, and this is z. Okay, so we see this differentiate between the polar radius and the spherical radius by using the Greek letter rho rather than r. But here they use the same r. And so this for you happens to not be the r that I have. And the reason I don't use that is because I have plenty of spherical problems that you might want to look at the uh, cylindrical problems where you want to compare to the spherical ones. And so there the R's are different, really. One yeah. is only in the x y z, the other one is everywhere in space. So then this is again Poisson's equation. And then the Laplace equations in some charge free region reduces uh, this Poisson's equation. Reduces Laplace's equation. So now I have to write down the Laplace operator in cylindrical coordinates, which is this expression. Okay. So now, what happens in uh, before we do this? What happens if I have a Poisson equation on the right hand side that it is a region that is uniformly charged? So if you have now you can do problems like this, uh, in which now you can do some limited problems in which say rho is constant in some region, say, of a cylinder. You have a cylinder or, you know, or a wire of infinite extent, and it has some rho in it. And so now you can also solve for this problem because it will not depend on phi. Okay? So these places in which it doesn't depend on phi and doesn't depend on c reduces to solving this equation, which is fairly, fairly straightforward. But let's, let's get that toward the end. So now, we separate variables again like we did before. So we break up my v here as a function of three functions that depend each one of them only on r, phi, and z, right? And once I have this, then uh, I then plug it back into my Laplacian equation and I divide, uh, which I get this, and then I divide by this v, okay? And now, Notice that I basically multiply by i squared over v. I don't have to do this because I have this r in here that I had before. If you look at this uh, equation right, that I have here, I have an r squared here. This is problematic if, and this is what the problem is when you have uh, uh, potentials of dependency, that you have this r squared. I cannot eliminate that from this equation. Zero. So the literal coordinates, you have a 1 over r squared sine squared theta, right, in a spherical coordinates, and so you could multiply the whole thing by r squared, and all the terms are eliminated. Here, I cannot do that. And so I'm left with this uh, term, which is given by this. So I multiply by r squared b, uh, which is r squared over r. Uh, this is uh, phi and z. This is a z here. This is a mistake. So I end up with this equation, and then I ask the question, what happens in problems that I have translational symmetry so that the potential does not depend on z, okay? And if that's the case, then the derivative with respect to z should be zero because the potential doesn't depend on z, so it's, it's basically a constant, and I reduce myself to this term. So I have two terms, again, one depends on your phi, and all depends on your r, and then what do we do? We set this equal to constant, and this has to be equal to minus my constant. So that is what I hope that. So now, what is this constant? And I already wrote this in here, but let me expand a little bit to, to this. So let's look at the phi equation. What do we have for the phi equation? So let's not call it any square yet. Let's imagine that you have this solution. I don't have 
have to call it k squared k could be an imaginary number if you want, but I call it minus k squared here for that constant. And so for the R equation, that's going to be called plus k squared. So what do we have in general? We're going to have the 2 phi the phi squared plus k squared phi is equal to zero. And so this is a solution like we have seen for harmonic oscillator, right? In which now the solution to this problem is phi or phi should be equal to a e to the i k phi plus b e to the minus i k phi. Or you can write it as a sine of k phi plus b cosine of k phi. Okay? So the, the issue is, is that I have my problem in this case reduced to this is y, this is x, and z is out of the board. So when I consider the point R here, which is at some angle P over there, this is the potential of that point, right? So now if you go around 2 pi, what happens? If I go around 2 pi, I come back to this point. And the value at that point cannot be different. It's just that is the point. Even if I go phi plus 2 pi, phi plus 4 pi, phi plus 6 pi, always at the same point physically. So that potential has to be the same. Which means that when I look at this, this has to be the invariant. And the translation, so phi goes to phi plus 2 n pi. You see what I mean? Which basically means what? That k cannot be anything it wants. Right? Because think of, think of this way, sine of k of phi plus 2 n pi. Well, say k is 1 over square root of 2. But that's not going to happen because phi plus 2 n over square root of 2 is, doesn't give you pi here. Right? This will not give me the same value that it had before. So what does it mean? k has to be an integer. Right? That's what it means. And if k is an integer, then that is what we have here. This is an integer. And so if k is an integer, so is k squared, right? So that's what we have is n squared here, okay? So this is the, 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 the part that is missing. So then now we have to have the r of phi plus 2n pi, not just pi, but 2n pi has to be equal to my potential, okay? And these terms then, I don't need to write the n, the minus sign, I don't, I, don't, I don't really need to. I basically just substitute myself by e to the 2 pi n p in here, okay? And so, um, like I, I have in, in this form, oh, n phi, and so those are called sonal harmonics. So e to the i n phi, we will call it a sonal harmonics. So this is my solution now for c to the n, because n is an integer, and uh, e to the n sine of n. So, Professor, five, five means what? Phi? No. Phi this, right there. This is the part of the potential V that depends only on phi. So I broke it up the potential in a part that depends on your R and a part that depends on your phi, right? Thank you. We did that right here. You see? We wrote V as R, phi, and Z. Oh, okay. So this phi is this guy. Thank you very much. So now what about the radial equation? So now I have N. And so now I have to have that this radial equation is equal to n square r. So I have to write it like this in this form. So let's consider the case of n equal to 0. That's the case I'm going to consider first. So what is that? Imagine n is equal to 0. And so if n is equal to 0, my equation becomes r square the 2r <coughs> plus the r square. So let me go write it like this. Let me write it as um, <coughs> r e r of r r r is equal to n squared. So for n equal to 0, what I have to have is, is that r times the r, the r is equal to k equal to a constant. Right? 
why? Because if this is zero, <coughs> then dvr will have to be equal to zero, which means that whatever I have inside here will have to be equal to a constant. So let's call hold that constant a. And so then I have to have the r, the r, the r is equal to a equal to a constant. So then I have to have the dr over little r is equal to a over r. So then I integrate this, and then I get that r as a function of r, then it should be equal to a times the log of r plus a constant, which is this point. So this is the solution when n is equal to 0. Okay. It's just a log of r, but this is what we do. So now in general, though, and you can actually substitute it for this, you're going to have that a sub n is equal to r to the mu, b sub n is r to the minus mu, and when you put that back in here, you will find that mu and mu are equal to n. Okay? So it uses the same thing that we have for convenience method. So you, you can imagine that this is of this form, and then you substitute it from here, term by term, and then collect the terms, and then, of course, a, the a terms have to be independent of the b terms, and then you will find that mu has to be equal to n. And so my solution then becomes the product of the r sub n and the b sub n. And this, I have to add the n equal to zero. And the n equal to zero is not included in the expansion because I already have included it in this term. So this is the real solution now. r of p is equal to a plus b log of r times the sum from n equals one to infinity of a n r to the n plus b n r to the minus n times this. Notice that I have you know, one, two, three, four different coefficients because I have two, right, second order equations, one for phi and one for r. I can't really do, like the other case, just two of these multiplying cosine and sine. So I have these two, this is my phi function, this is my r function, and so now this is my general solution that I have. So the coefficients are determined then by the boundary conditions, right? And then I have the orthogonality of the sine and cosine that we have solved seen at the beginning of chapter five, which is cosine of np, cosine of np is pi delta nm, because now you have to go from zero to two pi. You cannot go from zero to pi as we have before, right? Remember that. If you go from zero to pi, then this is pi over two. So then this is, these are the coefficients, and this is actually, uh, I ask you guys, did anybody do this integral? In general, without the limits, the cosine of np, sine of np, dp, is a DP is in, in missing in all of these, but I imagine that you understand that that's an integral in DP. Do you, anybody do this? We run out to you. We run out to you. From zero to pi, you can't run it by Oh, no, no, just without the limits. Without the limits? Yeah, it's going to be one half m squared over. So it's a one over m squared minus m squared terms. Yeah, it's going to be. And now, for n equals to m, which is the, the only case that matters here, this is equal to zero for n equals to m, okay? It's going to be one plus sine of n minus n x plus yeah. sine of n plus n x. Okay, so now let's do the first problem. And I'm going to do this. This is a problem in the textbook in which you have the following. And I'm going to do this over here, but I want to take a little bit of time to do this on the board. So we have to remember our solution, and I'm going to write the solution on the left hand side here. So my solution B of R was equal to a plus b log of r plus the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a to the n, r to the n plus b to the n. You can call these zeros if you want. b to the n, r to the minus n times c to the n. I forgot what I called this. I think it was uh, cosine. we 